We were assigned to fly over Holland, as it turned out. They split the group into two flights so that half went on the first mission by B-26s over occupied Europe. And they were to bomb a uh, power plant in a town called Imoiden in Holland. And uh, they went on over and they got shot up pretty badly, uh, but nevertheless came on back and only lost one ship. And it actually went down right over our field when they came back. Then three days later, on May the 17th, the, the balance of the group was assigned, and apparently, uh, according to the reconnaissance reports, uh, the first flight uh, had not destroyed the power plant. Well, one of the reasons was that we had 30-minute delay bombs, the purpose being to allow the Dutch to get away and not get hurt. Well, as it turned out, what the Germans did is they had their these Russian POWs to haul the bombs out and so that they never did destroy the, the uh, power plant. So we were sent to go and hit the same power plant. And as it turned out, again, uh, we uh, missed our proper landfall and we're kind of groping around uh, for, for a few minutes over Holland. And uh, but and two of our ships collided, went down into a canal, and uh, uh, I think uh, the rest of them were all hit. We were hit, and uh, one of our engines was on fire. Were you hit by flak or by yeah, by uh, flak. Flight no, by flak. Hell, you know they could shoot at you with a rifle when you were down on the low, deck. Low, See. Low. And what happened really was that on our way over, one of our guys aborted. And he jumped up to about a thousand feet, and we felt later that when he did that, their radar caught us. You said up to a thousand feet, what were you flying at? What altitude? Oh, 50 feet, just as low as you could fly. <laughs> as I've often said, you could see the, I exaggerate a little bit, you could see the wake of the plane ahead of you in the, in the ocean. No, no, you were flew really, as I say, as low as you could fly. And as, as it turned out, every ship went down. Nobody got back. Uh, when we hit the coast going back out, the other engine was on fire. And that's when we ditched. And a funny thing about it is I was flying co-pilot on that flight too because the plane that I had been assigned was damaged in that first run that they had. And so uh, we had somebody else's plane uh, for our crew. So you ditched in the channel? No, in the North Sea. The North Sea? Yeah. Oh, you were up the north of that. So. Yeah. Okay. But I started to say uh, they, they had fire extinguishers uh, for the engines, and, but the cable to it was behind my seat, the co-pilot seat. And I had to unhook my safety belt to get to it. Well, it didn't work anyhow, but I never refastened my safety belt, and that's probably what saved my life. Because right before we hit, I'd opened the top hatches, and we hit maybe at 150 miles an hour. Uh, and, uh, well, the ship went down pretty quickly. When I came to, I was underwater, caught on something, and I finally kicked loose and came up and pulled my May West plug. But... Uh, uh, all the rest of the crew drowned. I was the only survivor in that oh. ship. Yeah. So you survived that. Were you picked up uh, right away? Or? Uh, about three hours. I was out in that water about three hours, and it was frigid. But they, we had little escape kits which had uh, a, a morphine needle in it, and I gave myself a morphine shot, and you know, kind of made you feel rosy. Were you wounded in any way at that time? Wounded? Uh, yeah, I was shot through the leg and the hip. Okay. And uh, uh, my nose and collarbone were broken on the crash landing, but not seriously. Sounds pretty serious to me. But, well, compared uh, to yeah, some of the other yeah. things you saw, it wasn't. But uh, nobody uh, else survived that. Uh, no, no, that, did you? no. Okay. And that was the hardest thing to really 
come to grips with, I don't know that I ever have, you wonder how is it that you survive and these other guys who are as good as you are, you know, die. Um, you know. So you, did you spend any time in the hospital after that? Yes, a hospital in Amsterdam, and that's when I was in the operating room, uh, and the, you know, the Germans really treated us, that is the medical staff, as well as they were treating their own folks. Oh, so some, uh, an enemy, uh, some, some, uh, somebody from uh, German, the enemy picked you up. Oh yeah, it was a German patrol boat. And they took you over to the continent. Well, yeah, German over to okay. Amsterdam. Right. It okay. took them about right. an hour and a half to get there. But uh, uh, an amusing thing was that our Mae West, do you know what a Mae West is? Okay. But had We had some police whistles. Yeah, explain the Mae West. Well, a Mae West was the life preserver that you wore around your neck and you had it uh, uh, belted or around the middle and it had a little uh, air cylinder that when you wanted it inflated, you pull that uh, plug and it would uh, inflate and act as a life preserver, like which my is what, right? yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> which is what I did. But we had police whistles tied to it. And uh, I could see this boat out in the distance, you know, going back and forth, and I blew hell out of that whistle. <laughs> well, anyhow, they picked me up, and they were very nice to me, laid me out on the, on the uh, deck and gave me a shot of brandy. And the typical thing uh, that they would say to a uh, uh, prisoner of war was, for you, the war is over. <laughs> and I guess they were right in many ways. Um, so that's when you were taken as a prisoner of war. Yeah. yeah. When did you go from uh, the patrol boat? <laughs> to, uh, to Amsterdam and went to the Amsterdam General Hospital. And that's, as I say, we were treated as well as the, uh, the German uh, uh, armed personnel were treated. And, and, were uh, the Germans running that hospital or were the yeah. regular oh, Dutch yes. people running it? Oh, no, the Germans were running it. And uh, they were short on anesthesia, and uh, they, on bandages, they used uh, crepe paper bandages, which served the purpose, but nevertheless, there was a shortage of that at that time. And uh, we were in the hospital uh, a week, and then put in uh, uh, Red Cross cars, and taken to a place in Germany near Frankfurt, uh, where there was a dispersal station for prisoners of war called Dulag Luft. Well, I wasn't taken there. I was taken to Holmark Hospital because I was in a hospital for another month. Where That's when I was interrogated during that time. And uh, after that month and was shipped to Dulag Luft, then from there we uh, were sent to Stalag Luft III which was uh, in southeastern Germany, near the Polish border. Did they got? Was it anything unique about Stalag Three, Stalag Luft Three, compared to the other prisoner of war camps in the sense of the personnel that were there? Well, they were. It was run by the Air Force, right. and you know, Goering, despite all his other things, uh, was very partial to the Air Force as well as our own. And uh, uh, professional respect. Yes, yes, really. He was part of the old German Junkers group. And uh, the camps were run by, by the uh, uh, German Air Force. Uh, they were better than the army camps. Were they, all, were they only uh, British and uh, other Allied uh, flying officers there? or were they all, uh, Well, in our, in our camp, that camp, there were only British and American. Now, uh, ultimately, we went to uh, Stalag 7, which was uh, north of Munich, and there there were eventually over 300,000 prisoners. But of all names, shapes, and colors you can think of, you know. Tell us a little bit, if you will, about life as a prisoner of war, uh, the shelter, the food, uh, and things of that nature, please. Well, the, the housing were prefabbed huts and uh, they had uh, rooms in them. I don't remember the number of rooms now. I think it's in that paper. 
Uh, and it had a kitchen room where we'd cook uh, for our meals. Uh, it was situated in a, uh, uh, the, the terrain there was like pretty much like here, sandy and pine trees. And uh, uh, we would have uh, our compound, well, when I first went there, I was in a British compound. Uh, during that time, they were building a new compound for the Americans because they began coming in in pretty big much uh, numbers. Uh, and uh, in September, we were moved into this new compound where Americans were. Now, before that time, out of the British compound, the tunnels that finally ended up being the great escape right. were being dug. Well, uh, the greatest, so-called great escape was in March of 44. Were you right. there at the time? No, no. We were moved. Well, I was in Stogler 3, but we were in an American compound. Right. You were in Stogler 3, though. Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, yeah, I well remember. Boy, they had us all marched out, uh, and it was pretty darn cold uh, when that occurred, the Germans did. But uh, I worked on the the uh, uh, bellows, that was an air pump that would pump air down to the mouth of the tunnel through, uh, through a, a ducts or pipes made out of tin cans. Yeah, explain what the tunnel was. The tu this tunnel was in uh, uh, the north compound, which was a British compound. And uh, uh, the, the way it was constructed was under where a stove was located in this one room and they had worked out a system to where they could swivel that stove out and there would be the trap down to the tunnel. They had to go down 30 feet so that when you came under the, the guard fence, uh, where they had seismographs on the fence to de detect any digging, uh, at that level they wouldn't detect and that's why we went down to 30 feet. Well, it had to be shored up, you know, sand uh, would would uh, cave in on you unless you shored it up. And that was intended to be an escape tunnel. Sure. Correct? Oh yes, yeah. that that was a tunnel that became the Great Escape Tunnel. Uh, and the British were ingenious. They stole a bunch of wire and they had the thing wired with electricity. Uh, and of course they had a little uh, <laughs> railway. Uh, and it's, it really, you can't imagine how ingenious people are Anything when they have to. The well, they would steal it from the Germans, from the Gestapo a number of times. You know, they'd come in and search, and we'd steal more stuff from them than they were found from us. <laughs> <laughs> but, the, but the British were really bright in that kind of stuff. They, their intelligence uh, was much better than ours. Well, they, they'd yeah. had more experience. Yes, they'd had more experience, yes, they'd they'd had more experience but yeah, they were much better. You. Yeah. Yeah. But anyhow, they had this trolley, you know, where you'd, uh, they put sand in a, in a uh, big uh, uh, pan, sort of, and you'd pull this cart back and forth uh, to dump the sand, see, from the mouth of the tunnel. And they had, uh, and you couldn't turn around because the tunnel was shored by bed boards, bed boards that, that supported our mattresses. And, they, and of course, they would come around and confiscate, you know, they'd charge each uh, prisoner with one or two boards. And the boards were exactly 28 inches long and either uh, one by fours or one by sixes. And you would notch those boards at either end and to where they would fit together and make a solid uh, shoring. Uh, the problem was that in, tw in that 28 inches, you couldn't turn around, you know. So they had a halfway station, which they called Piccadilly Circus. <laughs> uh, well, that built. was a turnaround place? Right. You okay. could turn around down there. Uh, well, it was really something. And you were the bellows? Well, the yeah, my stint was four hours. I'd sit yeah. there, and you'd pump back and forth for four hours. Get a little air down there. Yeah, get air down to the mouth of the tunnel. But we were shipped out uh, much before they finally uh, broke the tunnel. Were well, any Americans uh, in that uh, 
escape. Break out? No. They were all British. From there were uh, some there. Dutch yeah. and uh, a Norwegian who had apparently been in the British Air Force. And only four out of, uh, well, they, uh, they figured that finally there were about 80 that escaped. They were all caught except four. And the uh, Germans shot 60 of them. And uh, are you familiar with the history after that, uh, what, is that, is that the war crimes trials, some of those Germans that participated in that? Shooting? Trial? No, I don't, I don't know what they ever got after them. Because it was done on Hitler's direct orders. Goering tried to stop it. But Hitler uh, was uh, pretty adamant about teaching those guys a lesson. But you yourself were trans. Uh, before I get to that, though, how was the food in Stalag? Uh, well, uh, the food was you got mainly potatoes, cabbage, uh, rutabagas. You know the rutabagas, yeah. Uh, that's what you generally got, and uh, and I learned to cook potatoes in every conceivable way in this world. <laughs> and you know these guys were good at creating. Uh, 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 cooking utensils, you know, out of tin cans. <laughs> uh, and you had a tremendous pool of talent. You know, when I went in, you had to have a college degree. But, uh, but there were a lot of very bright people in that camp. Well, you had the guys that forged papers, passes, uh, in German script. They would form uh, uh, stamps out of a rubber heel, carve it. Oh, it's just incredible what they would do. They make maps, uh, compasses. Uh, well, they would. Uh, there was a tailoring group that would redo uh, army clothing to look like civilian clothing. It was incredible what uh, the talent that you had in that kind of a group. When did you leave there to go to uh, Stalag Luft Seven? I think you said. Uh, we uh, January. Uh, my best guess is about January the 15th of 1945, yeah, is when the Germans, or the Russians were close enough to where we could hear their artillery. And the Germans came in one night and moved us all out. We just marched out of there. And it was terribly cold. Uh, and we marched for uh, over 60 miles. On the floor. Yeah, it was the worst experience I went through. It was, it was terribly cold. You know, you've heard of uh, your socks freezing to your shoes, and I always laughed at that, but by God, it, it happened. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but we marched. It was for four days. And uh, then we're put in boxcars and uh, shuttled around Germany and then taken on down to a place called Mooseburg, which was about 40 miles north of uh, Munich, Stalag 7. So if you would, tell us a little bit about your experiences at Stalag 7. Well, I was only there a very short time, and there there were enlisted men. See, whereas all the people in uh, Stalag uh, 3 were all officers. Uh, and they were taken, the enlisted men were uh, under the Geneva Convention, they could work them. And they would take them into Munich to work in cleaning out rubble and whatever. <coughs> and they'd come early in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning, and, and take these people, put them in boxcars, and haul them on down to Munich. <coughs> well, I switched with an enlisted man, an American enlisted man. He thought it would be nice to be in the officer's camp, which was uh, not true, but then he didn't know it. <coughs> I took his dog tag. He had mine. And uh, I went into uh, Munich on one of those working parties and just had uh, enormous luck all the way through that uh, trip. Uh, the, when we were marched out at five in the morning, dark, <coughs> they began checking us for contraband. And uh, fortunately, well, I had some chocolate bars which I'd stashed that I had in a little knapsack. And uh, I knew damn well if he found that, then the jig would be up, you know. But as it turned out, he was searching a guy in front of me, and I was able to go around him on the, 
on the uh, lineup that were going to the car to the uh, box cars. When we got to the box cars, they started searching again, <laughs> and I wondered, you know, whether I ought to go to the head of the line or kind of drag towards. It. So I finally decided to go to the head of the line, and again, fortunately, luckily. He was searching the guy ahead of me, and I tossed my knapsack in the corner of the car, and he didn't see it. And, and, and at any rate, we ended up in um, Munich, and in that morning, uh, we were cleaning out rubble at a, at a uh, military academy. And uh, uh, I had civilian clothes under my GI clothes. And uh, in the middle of the morning, there was an air raid, so we all went down to the basement of the building. And I went off from the group and into a small room to where you, at eye level, there were some windows going out to the street and went there and took off the GI clothes and uh, started to crawl out that window. And the German sergeant who was in charge of our detail was walking up the darn walk. And why in the world he didn't see me, I'll never know. But he didn't see me. He walked in the building. Well, then I crawled out, started walking south. Now, I knew where there was a French commando camp, and they were camps of impressed Frenchmen who were running the big state farms that the Germans had. And I knew the location of it just south of Munich. And I walked to it and went to it, and they put me up for the night. As a matter of fact, we played bridge, <laughs> and for the only time in my life, I made a grand slam, doubled and redoubled. Now, why the hell would you remember that, you know? <laughs> You're lucky day, that's right. Lucky time. <laughs> oh, God. What, 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 did you speak some French at the time? Oh, yes. I could speak French fairly fluently in those days. Okay. Uh, well, they gave me directions to the next camp. And it was, gosh, you, you know, when you listen to the directions, you thought, I can't be you. The, the to direction the next camp? To the next commando camp. Commando on, camp right. Yeah, okay. on my route. Right. <laughs> uh, and the, the, the uh, directions were, you go to this town of Traubing, a small town, there'll be a fork in the road, and in the fork will be a, a big farmhouse, and there'll be someone uh, pitching, a Frenchman pitching hay. And, you know, what kind of direction? <laughs> well, I went there, and sure enough, there was a guy, you know, you could do, the, the French all wore these uh, tams or berets. Right. And he took me to the to the camp there, and they gave me and put me up for the night. And they, they thought my hair was too long. They cut my hair. <laughs> and uh, they gave me directions to the next town in Starnberg, uh, which was a much larger city. And I went there and talked at some length with the, uh, the barracks chief, as he was called, a very intelligent fellow. And we discussed, you know, where I should go, whether I should try to get in through Switzerland or uh, directly from Germany or uh, uh, into Italy. And I could speak Italian fluently. Well, he uh, strongly recommended that I go in through Italy. And uh, he bought a ticket for me from there to Innsbruck. And uh, it was just really a dramatic kind of thing because he kind of passed the, uh, the ticket to me and uh, it was dark. Of course, they, they, uh, uh, everything was dark those days. In at the train station, said, bon chance, good luck, you know. And, and there again, I had another stroke of luck because just as we started to board, uh, Gestapo was checking papers. Uh, there was an iron pipe fence about three feet high separating uh, the, the uh, area from where you boarded the train. Well, hell, when I knew I didn't have any papers, you know. Uh, so I was able in the dark to vault that fence and go and get on the train. Did you, were you still wearing those dog tags you'd swap with the oh, yeah, yeah, Yeah. You had to do that because, you know, if you didn't, they would say, well, you're a spy, see? Under the Geneva Convention, they could shoot you. And they did, you know? So you went over the fence? Yeah, and got on the train and uh, went through Garmisch Partenkirchen. And there, we got all got off and were in the train station. There were a bunch of Italian workmen were being sent back to Italy. And I got to talking to them. 
And uh, you they. You tell them you were a USA. Oh yes, I told them who I was, and they were very sympathetic. You know, at that time, they well, of course, the Italians always hated the Germans, even from before the war. Uh, uh, then uh, from Garmisch, we went to Innsbruck, and at Innsbruck, uh, there were thirty-five Italian prisoners of war because they were part of the group that had rebelled and they were being escorted back to Brescia in Italy by two German guards and we used to call them goons. <laughs> uh, well, they split up into two groups, one 18 and one 17. Well, I stuck with the one that had 17 and eventually I guess the guy thought us, that he had the 18 and you know, he assumed that I was part of the group. And I stayed with them and uh, went on the train through the pass. Uh, didn't quite get through the pass because it was all bombed up and, and the tracks were out. And, and then the transportation was uh, on uh, big trucks, carbon-burning trucks. Run, Brenner Pass? Was it yeah. Brenner Pass? Yeah, the Brenner Pass. Uh, we stopped in Bolzano, and there's the Italian women had cooked a spaghetti lunch and boy. It was just wonderful. <laughs> you enjoyed the meal? Oh, boy. <laughs> sure did. Well, uh, the trucks went through Brescia, and these guys got off. I stayed on and got to Milan, and I had an address of somebody in Milan who would help. Where had you gotten that? Beg your pardon? Where had you obtained that? Uh, from uh, the group of Italians that I met in Garmisch Partenkirchen. Gave me, the, gave me the address of this fellow, said he was a partisan. Well, uh, I went there. And I, of course, remember the street number and the name of the street, because I later went back to it. Uh, and went there, and it was a pastry shop. You, if you can imagine, you know, a hungry POW. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, I asked him whether he knew this particular person. He said, yeah, I know who he is. I'll go find him. Well, he came back and said, he's gone. He won't be here today. What Can I help you? Well, I told him who I was then and said, if you can't help me, let me go. And he said, no, I can help you. And he put me up in an apartment, got me clothes, got me papers, and bribed. You know, bribery is, a, is a, an accepted means in Europe even today. <laughs> but he was able to get me uh, identity papers, false ones and uh, put, as I say, put me up in an apartment. And each day I would take the streetcar through the square on which is located El Duomo, that magnificent cathedral, you know, with a lot of spires. And it was really something that uh, was uh, very moving to me each day to go through that. Then uh, uh, I finally told him that I really needed to get back or try to get back to the American army. So he took me, we took the train up to Lake Como. Uh, he had a uh, friend, a Turkish woman, who was right there at the border and who had gotten a uh, uh, guide for me to go up to the, uh, and it was just a chicken wire fence between Switzerland and Italy. And I went there and he pulled up the fence and I crawled into Switzerland, went into a town of Ponte Gasso, which was on that lake there. And, and uh, gave myself up to the police. Well, I went through a pretty rough interrogation with a Swiss, because they said, you know, I still had those darn Italian papers, and they said, you're not uh, an American. You're an Italian. They wanted to intern me there, and I thought, oh my God, I've been through this to be interned here. And uh, I uh, really pretty much flipped my lid, and a Swiss major was there, he laughed and he said, well, we'll send you over to Geneva. They'll know whether you are uh, an American or not. And surely the next day, uh, uh, a Swiss private came and took me on the train and cleared to Geneva, where I went into the embassy there. You went to the embassy and did, uh, in Geneva, uh, did you eventually get back to your old unit or? To my old group? Old military group. Oh, where did you go from? Well, from there I went to, uh, uh, we stopped in Lyon. We went to Lyon on a truck, and then from Lyon to Paris in a DC-3. 
And in Paris, I went through interrogation uh, by the, um, the Army Intelligence and then uh, flew from there to the United States. About what day was that when you flew back home to the United States? About it, it was around April 1st. It was the early part of April. <clears throat> okay. And had I anticipated the end of the war, of course, I would never have escaped. Hell, it wasn't worth it. <laughs> but uh, at any rate, I was there.